John 7. I'll do Mark 6 first. Okay, let's go ahead and pray first. Lord, I do ask you to help us to open our eyes, each of our eyes, that we might see uh, what your word says and help us know how to apply it. And I pray you'd help us to see that your immediate family, it's, it's uh, not said, it's not uh, recorded how they responded uh, towards you as far as Savior. I pray you'd help us to be people to recognize that. And help us to do what we can to be a good testimony and witness to our, especially our immediate family. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, Mark 6. Okay, this morning I want to go on a topic of how to win your family and friends uh, to what, Christ or an idea or whatever. Now, it's kind of a misnomer, the title, because you could have all your... T's crossed, all your I's dotted, have everything perfect, be led by the Spirit of God, and that still doesn't mean they're going to accept it because they have a free will. But at least we can do what we can to uh, increase the odds. In Mark 6, uh, the mention here is about Jesus Christ and about his immediate family. Uh, Now, the Catholic Church doesn't believe these were real brothers or half-brothers of Jesus Christ. They say they're cousins, Uh, but I beg to differ on that. But still, the idea uh, is dealing with a family as far as uh, Mark 6, verse 1. It says, he went out from thence and came unto his own country. So that's where he grew up. So he probably, you know, came across some elderly lady. I changed your diaper for a little kid. You know, something like that. Okay, and so and his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? See, he's just a kid in town. They knew him as. Where did he get all this smarts? Where did he get all this stuff? Uh, verse 3, is not this the carpenter? Oh, he just works with his hands. He's a carpenter. He don't know this stuff. He's a farmer. He don't, you know, that's how people are. He's not educated. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? And then notice it says the brother. Same mom, different dad. The brother of James, we'd say Joseph, down south in San Jose or something like that. Uh, of Judah, Simon, there's his four brothers by name, and are not his sisters here with us. So I didn't give her their name, so he got a minimum of two. And it says they were offended at him. They were offended at him. That's typical reaction. And a person has to uh, learn to overcome that. Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor in his own country and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he had laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Why did they not believe in him? Just carpenter kid. He's a kid down the street. He he ain't nobody. And that's a common problem people have. And we need to understand that when we try to uh, educate others about ideas or truths. And he went round about the villages teaching. Now, if you would, John 7. John chapter 7. There's a common saying about family, and it says, blood runs thicker than water. Okay? And it's it's about the bond in a family. And I believe a person ought to do all they can to maintain that. Now, blood also runs within the family. (laughs) Meaning... (laughs) Uh, you, you ever see uh, brothers and sisters where they knock down, drag out, fight all the time, but as soon as somebody picks on the other brother and sisters, sisters they get together against that party. But um, in the Bible, the Bible is a, a real, very realistic book in that it records events and it doesn't uh, cover things up, shall we say. In chapter 7, it's about Jesus Christ again, and it mentions that in his own family, there was, in his own immediate family, there was a struggle and criticism of him. Did he have a right to criticize him? No. Didn't do anything wrong. But still, it's there. John 7, verse 1, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, 
for he would not walk in Jewry. That's down south because the Jews sought to kill him, so he stays up north. Now, the Jews' uh, Feast of Tabernacle was at hand, so there's an annual feast they had to go to, so he did have to sneak down south uh, to keep this feast according to Judaism. And his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If, if thou do these things, show thyself to the world. And then notice, for neither did his brethren believe in him. That's, that's James, that's Simon, that's his own half-brothers and his sisters. Okay, brethren or brothers, just the guys, they didn't believe in him. Now, it's an unusual silence. There's a very strange silence in the Bible about the immediate family of Jesus Christ. Uh, in fact, the last time you even, you only hear about his, his earthly dad, Joseph, his guardian, uh, obviously his heavenly father, but his guardian, Joseph, you only find him at the birth, <clears throat> and at 12 years old, nothing else is said. That's all you read about him. His brothers, all you read about them is right there in Mark 6. In John 7, okay, it does mention James, one of the four, James, after the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15 says James believed on him. After the resurrection. I don't know about the others. No idea. It doesn't say anything about them. Uh, Mary, of course, we know uh, the Catholic Church elevates Mary too much. That's because they want a matriarchal society. <laughs> but... Uh, Mary is mentioned in Acts 1. That's the last mention in Acts 1 at a prayer meeting. Uh, but then there, she might be in Romans 16, uh, verse 7, where Paul mentions a Mary there, greet Mary, but you don't know which one that is for sure. That's hard to pin that one down. The one in Acts 1 is clearly uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. And the last mention of her is at a prayer meeting. And nobody's praying to her. Okay, and so it's, I find it kind of interesting about the, the family of Jesus Christ, the immediate family of Jesus Christ. There were struggles in there, and there was criticism in there. <clears throat> Why did that take place? I mean, they had no beef against them. They couldn't say, well, you did this, and they did. No, he, he did what his parents told him to do. He did what uh, he could be the best brother of his brothers and sisters. And they couldn't point out, oh, you did this on this day, pointed a sin or something. No, nothing like that. But there was a struggle there. Now, the nation of Israel begins with a struggle in the family. You got Ishmael and Isaac. Didn't they have a fun, wonderful family reunion? They're still fighting it out. Then you have Jacob and Esau. I'm sure they had a nice Thanksgiving day. Those two to get together, that Jacob and Esau, always struggling back and forth. Then you got Joseph and his ten brothers where they sold him into slavery. So the, the entire nation of Israel, the foundation is a fight within families. Why, why doesn't blood run thicker than water? God chooses your family. He's the one that set that up. Okay, uh, you choose your friends. And sometimes people don't have... Uh, you know, they have broken fellowship with their family. Well, they did such and such. Yeah, but if you knew what your friends have done, they are your friends, they did the same thing, it's just that they didn't do it to you. Now, why do you have grace on your friends, but you don't have grace on your family? And that's just the way we are. That's just the way people are. Uh, I, I, I dare say you ought to do all you can to try to seek closeness in your family. On Friday night, we... Janet and I was traveling home from uh, Lansing, Illinois, and she was texting. She does the texting back and forth and due to Marco Polo. And here she is texting back and forth of all five of our adult children, Costa Rica, Australia, New York, here locally, and just going back and forth, back and forth. And I'm sitting there thinking, what a blessing to be in constant communication with your family. Okay, and... It, are they where God wants them to be? No, not all of them. But at least the communication's open between us. Something's good going on there. And what we want to try to do is maintain that. A lot of people have these hard feelings within the family, and it occurs, but what can we do to overcome that? So I dare say the best that we can do as an individual 
Seek to win your family to God and or to the truth. Do what you can. Now, there's no guarantee, even if you get everything perfect, there's no guarantee, but try to do the best that you can to give the best opportunity where this party has an opportunity to believe something. Open their eyes. Seek to make the truth enticing. Now, when I pray for folks that I know, acquaintances, guys I play basketball with, I know they're not saved, I do not pray, God, please save them. I don't do that. What I pray is, God, please open their eyes to the truth. Why? Because God will not cross their free will to force them to get saved. So I pray, God, please open their eyes. That's the greatest prayer you can pray for anybody, for yourself and others. The Bible is an eye-opening book, and it will show you things that you've never seen before. But the problem is most people have scales or spiritual cataracts on their eyes. They've got spirits that will not allow them to see those things. So a person needs to pray against that. God, please open their eyes and then help me to make the idea or the gospel, whatever it is, help me to be able to make it enticing to them. Okay, how do you do something like that? Well, you got to study. You got to study to make something very concise. And precise. I mean, commercials got 30 seconds to get their point across. Or 60 seconds. And they'll pay millions of dollars for the Super Bowl for a 30 second spot. So they got to put hours and hours into that to get something very concise. Nothing is more annoying than taking an hour to say something you can say in five minutes. I mean, I just, my brain goes in, I'm gone. I was down at Purdue, and I was you know, holding a Bible verse sign out there, passing out tracks, and this kid's talking to me. He talked to me for an hour. I mean, for an hour. And fortunately, I'm still passing out tracks, still holding my sign. And after an hour, I thought, man, I'm gonna, my ears are just getting burned by this guy. And I said to him, I said, man, you'd make a good college professor. He said, really? Why would you say that? I said, you just spoke for an hour and didn't say anything. And he laughed. I thought, I just insulted you, kid. And he laughed and he said, other people told me that too. And it's like, when are you going to let us sink in? You know, I believe the strongest words are words that are very precise, very short, and right to the point. And you just let them work. There's a guy that's a great orator. And they ask him, how much does he study for a two-hour lecture? He said five minutes. Really? How much do you study for an hour lecture? He said 30 minutes. Huh. How much do you study for a 30-minute lecture? He said an hour. How much do you study for a five-minute lecture? He said two hours. Why? Because he wanted to get the words so precise, so down, concise. And that's what we need to do. And study, it takes more brains to make something short and simple than it does to make it complex. It takes more brains to make something complex simple. And the thing is, is we want to study and be a student and figure out and drop, get all, get all the, you know, when you get down this point, go, you know, go to the scenic route and come this way and come around this way and come around this way. Go right to the point and let that point hit their conscience. You aim at their conscience. And you do that by asking questions. You learn to ask the right question to get people to think and open up their minds. And so that comes with a lot of study. People are captured by commercials. You heard a commercial, Cars for Kids? You've already heard the song, haven't you? About two years ago, they were changed the song to more of a rocky type song. And I thought, man, that ain't working. And they went back to the corny one. Why? Because it works. Short, concise, right to the point. So I'm going to give you some ideas about the idea of winning family or friends. Again, it's just the idea of trying to develop a, an environment that it makes it more, it makes it more enticing for a person to at least be curious about the topic or to be willing to look into it and be willing to uh, seek the idea, God limits the New Testament believer to the art of persuasion in giving out the gospel. 
That's what his limitation is. The art of persuasion. To use words to persuade people to the truth. That's what God has limited us. Now in the Old Testament, they can fight and kill over religion, but not in the New Testament. The religion of the Muslim faith is a faith of a tyrant. Why they force it to you by a bayonet or a gun or whatnot. Okay, and that's what the whole crusades was about. The crusades, people say, oh, that was between Christian and Muslim. No, it wasn't. That was Catholic and Muslim. That's different. That's a whole different game. Okay, the thing is, we are limited to words to try to persuade people. And what you do is you learn to ask a question, either about the topic or about what you're trying to get across, or about an inconsistency in their viewpoint. That's the problem. I would rather witness to somebody who's never been in church than somebody who's went to church all their life. Why? Because now you've got to go through all that veneer that they've had, that false ideas. You know, it's easy to paint a car, bare metal, put primer on, dry sand it, put paint on. But boy, when you got rust... And you got paint, you got to tear apart the old before you can put on the new. And so how do we do that? Okay, the first thought is this. God recorded, if you would, in Ezekiel chapter 14, God recorded three men about their righteousness. Two of these men, two of these men greatly influenced their family. Noah, Daniel, and Job. Now in type, they, they picture three different men that overcame the three basic enemies of a believer, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And Noah overcame the world, Daniel overcame the flesh, and Job overcame the devil. In Ezekiel 14, 14, Ezekiel was a strange guy. Had some weird, a lot of weird uh, ideas God gave him. Very strange thoughts. Okay, and he and he's telling uh, Judah, you're going to get destroyed by God. And God's sick of you. He's tired of it. He's done with it. He told Jeremiah, don't pray for him. He said, don't even pray for these people. I don't want you to pray for him. I'm not going to listen to you. So that's, when God gives up, that's pretty bad. Oh, in Ezekiel 14, he says this in verse 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, so it's in the same order that we usually say the three bait world, flesh, and the devil. And it says, though these three men were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Now he added a PS on that in verse 20. Same three. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, makes an oath, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Ah, that's something. Now, what did those... Daniel, his family is probably killed, so no influence on his family there. But Noah and Job had an influence on their family. In Job chapter 1, Job's uh, ten children, ten adult children, were having a get-together. I don't know if they had a birthday party or something. Okay, and it's funny, Jehovah's Witnesses say it was a birthday party, and that's why they don't want to celebrate birthday parties. Okay, and it's one of the reasons. Uh, the other one is Pharaoh had a birthday party and somebody got hung at it. So they say it's wicked to have birthday parties. So I guess you can't have birthday parties because you're going to hang somebody at birthday parties. But even at that. Okay, so uh, they were at a party and Job, you know where Job was at? He was offered a sacrifice. Job 1, verse 4 and 5. He was interceding for his adult children. He said, maybe they cursed God. I don't know. And that tells you and I that we should intercede for other people. Go to God in prayer for other people. They don't even know what they're supposed to be doing, but God does. And so we can intercede for them. Job interceded for them. And, that, and God honored Job for his intercession for his own children. And so that tells us, okay, we parents, grandparents, grandparents especially, interceding for their adult children and their grandchildren. I mean, that's what we should be doing. Okay, now God told Jeremiah, don't do it. And he told Elijah, or Elisha, Elijah, intercede against Israel. That's pretty bad. That's a pretty bad situation. Now with Noah, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, Noah preached righteousness. He told the world, he, for over 100 years, he said, don't miss the boat. 
He said, don't miss it. They didn't have the sense coming out of the rain. And so he preached righteousness, and the only ones that he convinced or persuaded was his wife, three boys, and their wives. And that was it. And God honored them for it. You see, you can tell a lot there in that uh, those three boys said, boy, dad, he's out there. He's woo-hoo. Something's going on here. But he believes what he believes, and he practiced what he preaches. And so those three boys said, I may not be getting it, but I trust him. And they got in a boat. Boy, aren't they glad they did that. I'm sure they had a lot of thoughts when that water's coming down. Boy, dad, well, you sure knew something nobody else knew. That's right, they got in there, but he recorded their actions. Another thing, if you would, go to Romans 16. Another idea is that the Bible mentions, and these are things just tucked in the Bible, is that Paul, the Apostle Paul, remember before he got saved, he was Saul, he was a Judaizer, and he would kill people over religion. So he was a Roman uh, citizen, And he would have the authority to go into an area and find out these Christians and he'd kill them. Take the kids from the parents and he'd have them killed. Well, then he met Jesus Christ and got saved. He did a 180. And in Romans 16, look who he influenced. You would think, wow, you got to really think about that from a persecutor to a preacher. And I'm sure his cousin, his kin would say, yeah, Paul, you were wrong over there. How do you know you're not wrong now? He said, well, because I met Jesus Christ, that's why. Well, yeah, yeah, you're just a fanatic, that's all you are. You're just a fanatic from one religion to another, that's all you are, Paul. And he didn't win all of them, but he won a few. Romans 16, verse 7, there's two names, Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen. Well, that's good, there we go. Okay, then drop down to verse 11. Uh, salute Herodian, my kinsman. Oh boy, he was in, uh, he was in the, uh, political position. Herodian, my kinsman. Got another one. Uh, verse 13, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. That's his brother and his mom. Doesn't say anything about his dad. But his mom got saved and his brother. Doesn't say, I don't know if he had more than one brother. He was never married, at least no record of it. And if you drop down to 21, uh, you have uh, Timotheus, my work fellow, so that's Timothy, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sopater, my kinsmen. There's three more. Now, obviously, he had more kinsmen. And I wonder, I wonder, later in Paul's life, when he's out and about witnessing for Christ, that he came across people, kids, that he killed their parents. I wonder about that. Maybe he did. And they didn't want anything to do with him because of that. I have no idea. But here's here's the third idea. And this is probably the most important idea to get across and understand in our relationship with people. You've got to act according to the role that that party sees you. Okay, what do I mean by that? Did his brothers reject his words because all they saw was a big brother? You're my brother. You're not a prophet. You're not a savior. You're my brother. Now, you and I as individuals, we should be able to accept the words from any source. Truth is truth no matter who says it. An error is an error no matter who says it. Okay, but how do people view you? Are you a brother? Are you sister? A sibling? Are you a child? Are you a grandchild? If you're going to witness or give an idea across to them, people, those people, individuals, you have to approach them from the role they look at you as. An elder? Okay, a cousin? Okay, a friend, a friend, uh, you know, where you've chosen to be friends with you, you're equal there, but uh, you can't talk to an older person that you can talk to somebody your age. It's a different approach. Jesus Christ said, you got to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. When I started pastoring here many years ago, about six months into it, Ronnie was walking out the door, and I just pulled him aside and said, Hey, Ronnie, I'm still your kid brother. When I go to the farm, they don't call me pastor. It ain't happening. 
I'm Dave. I'm the runt of the family. I'm the fourth born. Pee Wee was my, Arnold was my name in, in, my nickname in elementary school because I could be like Arnold Ziffel on the Green Acres. I can, you know, like that, you know, so they gave me Arnold. And then Pee Wee because I was 5'2 when I got my permit, 5'6 when I got my license short. And, and so, uh, you know, I was a run of the family. I, I don't expect them to look at me as, quote, their pastor. Now, as they're sitting here, they gotta view me as a pastor, not as son or brother. Why? You have different roles. Most people only look at you as one role. That's how most people do it. You don't know anything. You're my sister. Stupid sister. You know, and so you have to recognize that and you have to act according to that role and learn to be a servant to them under that role. Serve them. Jesus Christ said to serve in all is greatest of all. And that's what he says we're supposed to do. Why? It's for their sake. In order to persuade them, we have to persuade them on the viewpoint they look at us. Okay, when a family member gets excited about the truth and they come and want to cram it down your throat, what's their reaction? Get out of my face. Don't want to hear it, especially from you. Don't want to hear it. But that's how people are. So, I don't know, did the siblings of Jesus Christ not perceive him to be a savior? They obviously didn't. Well, when he comes up out of the grave, the last time I saw him was on a cross, and looked like a hamburger on a cross, and he rose, raised from the grave. James said, you're not only my brother, you are my Savior. He saw a different viewpoint of Jesus Christ. Now, a person should focus on the words, no matter who says it. But when we live a resurrected life for Jesus Christ, it makes our witness more powerful. So, how do we people, as grandparents, why is, is the child or teenager or grandchild to listen to his grandparents? Grab that wisdom. This generation in America, our culture is pathetic on the idea of wisdom respecting the ancients. It's pathetic on that. And that's why the way they are. Why would you go to somebody that's your contemporary for advice? They have as much experience as you got. Go to somebody who's got some years on them for advice. And grab that wisdom and pull it out of them. Draw it out of them. And you'll save a lot of heartaches in your life. You see, that's where Rehoboam went wrong. He went to his own peers and then God took the kingdom from him. Instead of listening to the older. But uh, idea, you got to really think on this idea. Act according to the role your loved one perceives you. Parent, grandparent, sibling, cousin. Okay, the next thought. Uh, discover their desires or likes or interests in life and seek to fulfill them. Now, if it's a valid something, if they like sports or like their sports team, get that, figure that out and bring it up. Take a genuine interest in them, in their likes and dislikes. Seek to serve them in that capacity. Okay, and Jesus Christ said, you know, you want to seek the weightier matters of the law. Now, if it's something that's not good, then okay, that's different. But a sincere desire or interest that they have in their life, take an interest in that. You say, I don't have an interest. Well, get an interest in that because their soul is more important than our qualms. That's where, that's where Paul said that, you know, to the Jew, I'm a Jew. To the Gentile, I'm a Gentile. Now, obviously, I'm not going to get drunk to win a drunk. You know, I had a guy that would go up and he would get guys around a table and they'd smoke and drink and he'd teach them the Bible. Now, that's not my methods. <laughs> Okay, but I knew a guy that did that. That's not going to work, you know. But still, discover their desires and seek to take an interest in them. They will, they will experience, they, they'll recognize you care for them. Okay, next thing. If an offense has occurred or perceived to have occurred, humble yourself. Okay, if they're charging you, if, if maybe there was an offense, okay, 
And that's a hindrance. Why? Because Proverbs 18.19 says, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, for their contentions are like the bars of a castle. So maybe there's an offense. Apologize. Tell them you're wrong. Put no blame on them. And hopefully they can accept that and move forward. What if they perceive you've offended them? I tell you, people nowadays, they perceive things. There's no wrong, there is no wrong that you can apologize for something you never did because your pride is not as important as their soul. It's still better to, to uh, it's still better to say, okay, uh, you know, I didn't realize that, but fess up. When I was in Colorado, uh, they had the building here, uh, the church building is on the highest part of the city, and then you drive past the building and the parking lot's over here. It's kind of a bad place to put the parking lot because you're Christian cross and you're coming in. And I came in, you know, and uh, I get in the building and this woman said to me, you got ran over my kids. And I said, what are you talking about? You came in too fast. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I, you know, I didn't, you know, if I wanted to run over her kids, I would have ran over them, but I, you know, I didn't run over them. And so it was like, and I went to the preacher, I just off the cuff said, hey, man, this lady charged me with this, man, I didn't do anything. He said, why don't you just apologize? And I knew the man, I knew he wouldn't do it, but I'm glad I did. Why? Because that was her perception. Even though it was off, that was her perception, and okay, I, you thought I did that? I'm, I apologize for that wrong. Why? Because it was more important for my pride to be damaged than for her to be damaged. Humble thyself. Did not Jesus Christ take upon him our transgressions? I do believe he did that. I mean, he took upon the sins of the world upon himself. He didn't have to do that. But he did. And so we can, there's no reason why we cannot swallow our personal pride for the eternal benefit of somebody else. No reason for that. Offer a sincere apology without blame. Okay, now if it was a real legitimate offense, that just because they accept your apology, that just doesn't mean you can charge in. Okay, now that we've got that taken care of, I want to tell you something. No, you got to tread lightly for a while. You got to prove yourself to them. Prove your sincerity. Be patient. Display charity towards them. Be honest about things. If the apology is accepted, praise the Lord, you've gained a brother. No true friendship is without offenses and restoration. People say, well, he hurt my feelings. Well, get over it. No marriage is without offenses and restoration. In our culture, people are quick on, quick off. And that's the shallow people. When you have a relationship, you're going to go through good times and bad times, and that's what makes that relationship strong. And when you can overcome offenses. Okay, and if an offense has occurred or perceived to have occurred, humble yourself. Why? For the sake of family, do what you can. Okay, now here's where you got to draw the line. If the party is committing a an ungodly act, okay, a bad lifestyle, and seeks your approval, that's where you draw the line. Sorry. You see, now, if, if I was in a situation like that and they wanted my approval of their sin, that's what I would just kind of back off and I would kindly start asking a bunch of questions. And I would try to hit them right in the conscience with my questions. Are you trying to defile my conscience? Is that your intent? I have to live with myself. And if I put my stamp of approval on what you want me to put a stamp of approval, it's going to damage my conscience, and I want to live within myself. <laughs> and I'm just going to say, no, I'm not going to do it. That's where you draw the line biblically. A lot of times I've heard people say, well, I've had to break fellowship with so-and-so. Blah, 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 blah. I've never had to break fellowship with anybody. Never had to break it. I would just tell them what I believe, and they leave. <laughs> Saves a lot of headaches. <laughs> I don't know if it's body odor. I don't know if it's garlic. I don't know what it is. It's not garlic because I don't have much of that. <laughs> 
But still, the idea is that we can avoid a person. We can kindly make a stand for Jesus Christ. Okay? This is why the church is being forced in this age to say something about sodomy. Because they are demanding our approval. I'm not going to give my approval for that. Over my dead body, am I going to give my approval for that? I can be kind. I can be gentle. But I'm not going to say I'm going to put my stamp of approval on that. No way. Over my dead body. Okay? And so, you can do that kindly. Jesus Christ, when Judas Iscariot came to Jesus Christ to betray him, how did he approach him? He said, friend. Now, if Judas Iscariot would have tried to pull three or four disciples to the side and try to try to undercut Jesus Christ, that's when he would have done something. But that wasn't taking place. Judas Iscariot was a walking, talking devil. That's a weird character. Jesus Christ, one of his 12 apostles, was not a, quote, flesh and blood man like you and I. He was a transformer from a devil to a man, just like the Antichrist will be. And the apostles didn't even know it. Didn't know it. And Jesus Christ did not rebuke him in front of them. Why? Because Jesus Christ was in charge. Now, if he would have came and said, I want your approval of, that's when Jesus Christ would have made his stand. And that's where we make our stand. Even in John chapter 8, when they caught this woman taking adultery in the very act, Jesus Christ did not say, where's the guy, you dirty rats? All he did was gently wrote on the ground something on the ground, wrote a few words, put a question. I don't know what he did. Maybe he put a passage of scripture on the ground. And let them guys read it, and they got convicted, and they were left. So that tells us we need to aim at the conscience. So if somebody is going to say to me, I want your approval of this behavior, I'm going to say, why do you desire my approval? Are you insecure that it's not right? You must be insecure that it's not right since you're desiring my approval. Do you think God approves of that? If I put my stamp of approval on that, that would defile my conscience. Is it your intention to defile my conscience? i got to live with my conscience. You don't have to live with my conscience. i got to live with it. Is that your intention? Is it your intention to defile my conscience? Is that your intention? Is it your intention to damage my family? Is that your intention? Why are you so... Adam to get my approval of something. Why don't you go to God and ask him about his approval? That's what I want you to do. Please go to your God and ask him about his approval. If I approved him, it wouldn't make any difference anyway. Except it's going to affect my conscience. And I, I want my conscience pure. It helps me sleep better at night. I like to put my head on a pillow with a clean conscience. I don't want to have to take about ten sleeping pills to sleep at night. I want to sleep with a clear conscience. And so that's what I would do. I'd just start, keep hitting them with that. Keep hitting them with that. Do you want me to revel in your actions? Is that your intention? And you know what you're going to see? Is you're going to see one of two things. They're going to leave. And you don't have to tell them to leave. Or, they're going to get under conviction. That's what you want. And hopefully go to their God and ask God about that. That's what we want. And that's when we go back to our prayer closet, and we get on our knees, and Lord, please open their eyes. God, please open their eyes. Please open their eyes. Cleanse them with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Take them unclean spirits and take them away. Open their eyes to the truth. You see, and that's, that's more of an approach that God works. I find it interesting, of the 12 apostles, three... There were three pairs of brothers. We only know of two, but there's three pairs of brothers in there. Brother got brother. Man, blood runs thicker than water. I mean, God gave you your family. Do what you can to win them. Make the gospel or the truth or whatever it is enticing to them. Do what you can. And even if we have to humble ourselves, do what we can. 
Why? Because eternity is much more important than my temporal pride. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help each and every one of us to do what we can to witness to our uh, family, our kin, our children, our grandchildren, our uh, brothers, sisters, our aunts, uncles, cousins, whenever that opportunity presents itself. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to approach that in a Christ-like fashion. I wonder, I wonder about your brothers. We know of James. I wonder about those. Could they not get over the idea that you were their brother? Could they not accept you to be Savior? I don't know. I hope they did for their sake. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help each and every one of us in our influence of our family and friends. Help us to fulfill that role that they see us in and help it to be Christ-like. Help us to be able to study and get knowledge down to very concise and learn to ask questions and hit that conscience so that they might consider their Savior. Lord, I do pray for that. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed with that.